In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Ave Maria Purissima. So in the epistle we hear today, let every man be swift to hear, but slow to speak, and slow to anger. You can sum up the lesson then, uh, and the, our homework for this week, that Saint, and for the rest of our lives, really, that St. James gives us is to be quick to hear by practicing silence, and slow to speak, and slow to anger by practicing meekness. So we'll focus on those two uh, virtues today. Silence, not actually being a virtue, but rather the disposition to practice virtue. The virtue which our Lord tells us is the one thing necessary on which all other graces depend, that is prayer. Right? We recall that our uh, God the Father sent forth his word. He has spoken, and there's nothing more he can say, right, as he has revealed himself entirely. All is the, 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 in the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son. And so we have heard his word, we have seen the word full of grace and truth. And so the fundamental disposition of the Christian soul is to hear ye him, right, as God the Father commanded us. Where the psalmist also says, truly thou art a hidden God. And if we never practice silence, we will never hear his voice, okay? And that's, uh, we recall Elias in the Old Testament, right? The Lord God of hosts, of armies, was going to speak to him, to Elias, who was zealous for the cause of the Lord, slaying the prophets of Baal. And he did not hear him, the Lord God of armies, in a thunderous noise, but rather in a soft whisper. And so he continues to speak to us, as our Lord tells us, I have yet many things to teach you. And we ask ourselves, and then he says, it's expedient, therefore, that I go. Well, hold on. Let's ask the honest question. If he has many more things to tell us, how is it expedient that he leaves us? Right? Let's think about it for a second. If he's risen from the dead, glorious, you know, he could have just remained amongst us. He could have traveled around the world, you know, and taught us. He could have remained in our day. He could have had a Twitter account. We could have been friends on Facebook, right? He could message us. It would be, wouldn't that be easier, right? Uh, how is this more expedient that he leaves? Our Lord says it is so. So we ask, we rightfully ask the question, so as to gain that wisdom hidden therein. And it's really the whole mystery of the ascension, right? Why is it better that our Lord is ascended now at the right hand of the Father? So that we seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. He's going to be even closer to us than a physical presence. He's going to be present by his one same Holy Spirit, which dwells within us. But here's the catch. We have to be more spiritually minded so as to hear him. And that's why it is more expedient. It forces us to not just receive, right, this gift, but to correspond to that gift, and to become more like Christ by a spiritual life. And so that we need to spend time in every day in prayer and in silence. Again, the one thing necessary. That's where we hear God's voice and where you know, in his light, we see light. If we practice a more habitual recollection, we're going to hear him speaking to us throughout the many circumstances of our life. It's not just in church. It's not just in the homily. It's not even just in our spiritual reading. But if we do that, we'll sense through his providence, he's speaking to us always. So we ask in that fifth joyful mystery, the grace of seeking God in everything. So we see in his life, even the sorrowful mysteries were part of his plan. So let us not uh, be deaf to the word of God, but quick to hear, ready to hear, right? Uh, and if we do so, we'll have greater meekness. But now transition that second point, meekness, so as to moderate our anger, being slow to speak, right? That's why our Lord, as one of my confreres preached uh, one Sunday, he said, that's why God put a double lock over our tongue. St. James describes that little member, but which can light the whole forest on fire like a match, right? By just one bit of gossip or ruining someone's reputation. So that's why we have both teeth and lips. We've got to open, we've got to unlock both of those, right? So it should give us some time to think before we speak. And related to meekness, it's generally the first question I would have as a physician of souls. Someone comes to me saying, oh, I'm just losing my patience, I'm getting angry. First question is going to be, have you neglected your spiritual reading? Have you neglected your mental prayer? 
I note that you don't have peace in your soul, whereby you're use, you losing it very easily uh, by, in, from what is without you. Okay? So key to practicing meekness is first prayer and silence. And then secondly, regarding meekness, note that St. Thomas explains it's to moderate our anger. So anger uh, has a just moderation. This is not referring anger in an exclusively sinful sense. We should be angry, as uh, the psalmist commands us. Be angry, but sin not. Right? What is anger as a natural emotion? Right? When something, some evil approaches us, attacking, putting at risk that which we love, might be difficult to overcome, we feel anger. And that's a natural passion. We see it in the animals. That's why they're going to try to defend their own or their life. Right? We should feel anger. It proceeds from love. Right? And if I had to describe our own uh, culture, I would say the predominant sin is not an excess of anger, but a defect, a lack of holy anger, right? And this uh, was uh, one of our presidents, I believe, said, all that's necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing, right? To relax, to just be tolerant. Right? This is what uh, is uh, this, he echoed uh, the words and the sentiments of the saints, St. John Chrysostom says, he who is not angry when he has cause to be sins. For unreasonable patience is the hotbed of many vices. It fosters negligence and incites not only the wicked, but even the good to do wrong. There's a norm for Christian parents, right? How you're trying to uh, form your children. You have to communicate anger when they do something uh, seriously wrong, and we'll see in a moment how we should do that, following the example of our Lord himself. But again, it's the hotbed of many vices, that wicked, sinful tolerance, which no one wanted to apply, right, to, uh, to the risk of a virus which could harm our body. Right? We were absolutely intolerant, right, taking all measures possible, uh, running around like Mr. Monk, wiping everything down, right, after we touched it. It was we took great caution to preserve the health of our body. What about the health of our soul, right? If we, uh, unreasonable patience, tolerance of evil allows evil to triumph. And so we have the example in our Lord himself, right? Did he show anger? He did, right? And in the most just and holy way, manner. When, for example, uh, they were profaning his father's house, the most sacred place where God dwelt with his people, he saw they were profaning it, and the gospel writer tells us that he fashioned an instrument, a whip. What does that indicate? This is that phrase alone. It means that he thought about what he was going to do. That's the model, first, first uh, point to reflect on. He didn't explode. He thought about how he was going to punish them. He thought about what words uh, to instruct them and, and correct them, and then he carried it out. There's the model, and what I encourage for parents, too, uh, you to have your plan of discipline already thought out, right? For this offense, you receive this punishment, because justice demands it, not because you just lost your cool and are angry, right? You want to inculcate the sense of justice, so being constant in that it's because of this offense, you receive this punishment, okay? And doing so with a meekness, whereby you're seeking the justice of their soul. This is what St. Paul admonishes in many places, but how we should be, uh, if, any, uh, if anyone is overtaken in some transgression, you who are spiritual must instruct such a one in a spirit of meekness, looking to yourself, with modesty admonishing them that resist the truth. You're trying to, that they may recover themselves from the snares of the devil, by whom they are held captive at his will. Right? So you're treating, seeking this triumph of justice in their souls. And that's, uh, uh, meekness, uh, though, though we can justly moderate anger, at the same time, it's a very strong passion. And in a sinful manner, it becomes the vice, the capital vice, from which many other sins flow. That's why it's called capital. St. Francis de Sales observes, if anger lasts until night and the sun sets upon it, which the apostle forbids, it's always the custom of trying to reconcile before you go to sleep, it converts into hatred, and it's very difficult to get to rid oneself of it. And it begins to feed a thousand false persuasions, since an angry man hardly ever believes his anger to be unjust. 
And thus our Lord puts it amongst the Beatitudes. But note how St. Francis de Sales describes how it consumes the soul, right? And our Lord says, taking away its peace, our Lord places meekness amongst the Beatitudes. Beatitude, happiness. The eight uh, states there of happiness or Beatitudes. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Key to happiness, being meek. And also it's our, how our Lord told us to pray, right? Uh, forgive us our trespasses as we, to the degree that we forgive those who trespass against us. According to the measure you measure others, it will be measured unto you. Okay, so we get to decide how our judgment, how strict our Lord will be in our judgment, with how merciful we are to our neighbor. And uh, for, uh, to see where we're at, Cornelius Alapide, that great scriptural commentary, you have most of his New Testament commentary for free there on the IPETA app, and uh, just wonderful, and he gives us five uh, degrees of meekness. So it's so important for our happiness. All right, where am I at in terms of practicing meekness? First step, or first degree would be to speak to all with a meek heart and words. Speak to all with a meek heart and words. Right? Be slow to speak, speaking meekly. The second is to respond to the anger of another with a meek response. Right? Taking a little bit deeper. It's easy, perhaps, for those who are somewhat timid, right? Who naturally seem to practice meekness, so they speak meekly. But when they're angered, we'll see. And honestly, it's really the, the proof of virtue, right? There's many a seemingly pious soul, right? Spends a lot of time in prayer. is very recollected. But make them angry and see how virtuous they are, okay? So do we respond to the anger of another with a meek response? A second degree, third degree, to suffer meekly offenses of others. What does that mean? Maybe you didn't respond, but internally, you're desiring all sorts of evil upon them. So to suffer meekly offenses of others, even interiorly. The fourth degree, to even rejoice in such offenses. This is taking it to a supernatural plane. But what's our supernatural motive, right? We have to consider, again, if we're listening to God, perhaps through this event or this, these uh, harsh words from another, or this cross I have to bear, maybe he's punishing me for my sins. Am I innocent? Well... Take a, a look at your examination of conscience, right? How many times have you been to confession? One mortal sin has merited eternal punishment. Okay, I'm not innocent. No one is just. No, not one. All right, can I rejoice in this? I have a chance to repair my sin. I have a chance to offer something up. Maybe I'll save a soul that's on its way to uh, die and be sent to hell. Maybe I'll save them by offering this up. And then the apostles, you know, rejoice to suffer uh, for the name of Christ. What good company and what good fruits it can produce. And fifthly, the fifth degree, to conquer the ill will and anger of our enemies with meekness and good deeds, even to reconciling with them as benevolent friends. That seems very supernatural, right? But this is, a, this is the gospel aim, right? To overcome evil with good. And honestly, it's what uh, most uh, impresses me in our Lord's example, Condiment of Sorrowful Mysteries. I think I'm more impressed by the third sorrowful mystery than the second, right? Thinking of how much he suffered physically, excruciating pains. I think even more impressive is how he suffered people spitting in his face and mocking him, crowning him with thorns. And he's God, he's, he's holding them in existence. He could send angels to wipe them out. He could tell them exactly what they're doing. He could hold them back, but he opens not his mouth. Those moral humiliations. I think those are even deeper sufferings. And we have examples, too, of, uh, of human uh, persons as well. Uh, one practical example, I think, for many of you, imagine uh, one Francois de Chantal. Okay? She's married at this point in her life, 29, beautiful family, four kids. She loves her husband, she's a great husband. She says, oh, if I love him so much, how much more I should love God. And then she loses him one day in a hunting accident. His friend and he are out hunting, and he accidentally, by, mistake, uh, by carelessness, uh, injures him, and he dies. So what would you feel, right, as a wife? Now your whole marriage has changed here as your husband died. You'd be tempted to a lot of resentment uh, towards that, that family that caused his death. You know what she did? 
She treated him with the greatest kindness, in spite of what she initially felt, and even became the godmother of their children, right? uh, treating them as if they were her own. Heroic examples, but again, God's, with God's grace, all things are possible. And how is it possible? Uh, the same Cornelius Alapide gives us four steps to grow in meekness. The four steps, so we'd see the degrees where we need to go. How can we get there? First counsel is one to think of the terrible nature and harm that anger can cause. Having consumed and destroyed individuals, families, and whole kingdoms. Right. I'm sure you know enough from your personal experiences, right? Uh, whether in your own family or in others, how it's destroyed marriages, friendships, families, even whole kingdoms, right? In seminary, we read the sort of a summary of world history in that great uh, work, treatise of Warren Carroll and the history of Christendom, and, you know, the destination of whole countries sometimes depends on one leader, one king, who can't control his anger, and plunges that country into war, ruins thousands and thousands of lives. So just have a great fear, right? Anger out of control can totally ruin your life, the lives of others. Secondly, to not speak or act while one is still angry, waiting until one has calmed down. Pretty simple advice. I believe, uh, I think I read one time of how Scientologists, okay, this strange uh, secular pagan religion, but they have this practical, uh, this practice that, they, that you're not to respond, right, until you have thought for something like 60 seconds or 90 seconds. Interesting, right? Slow to speak. Uh, quick to listen. How many times have we regretted, right? Speaking in the moment, and I wish I wouldn't have said that. Okay, pause, think, right? Unlock the teeth, unlock the lips. Gives you time to think. Okay. Thirdly, being of noble spirit. There's a saying of the Romans, aquila non uh, capit muscam. The eagle doesn't capture flies. It's another version of the lion, right? He just kind of waves his tail at them. It would be beneath the lion, right? If you get all tried to, you know, attack the flies, it would show that he's not so noble, right? And that these little flies can get under his skin, that they can manipulate him. We give another power over us, right? When we allow them to, uh, uh, by our lack of meekness, when they, uh, we allow them to make us angry. And so it's a sign of true, true strength, right? And just thinking of the natural pride, right? I'm above this, noblesse oblige, right? You are a Christian soul. Uh, and it's not a sign of weakness, but rather a power and strength. St. Francis de Sales, beautiful phrase, says, nothing is so uh, strong as gentleness, and nothing is so gentle as true strength. Right? Consider the omnipotence of God, all-powerful, which he manifests, as one of the colleagues say, uh, principally by showing mercy. He's above that. We can't take his peace away. He can wait patiently to convert us, and how patient has he been with each and every one of us for all of our life. And so, uh, be of noble spirit. And lastly, consider the example of Christ, led like a lamb to his slaughter, meekly enduring, being insulted, betrayed, mocked, crowned with thorns, spit upon, and crucified, not opening his mouth. A practical example, no, we can relate to in terms of betrayal, right? The upper room, we'll see it, uh, we see it in our Lord's resurrection. He's with them in the upper room. It's like the first reunion they're having, right? Since when? When were they in the upper room? Just recently, Holy Thursday, where our Lord expressed what great desire. He desired to eat this pass with them, to give them his body, blood, soul, and divinity. He washes their feet. I no longer call you servants, but friends. Do this in commemoration of me. He gives them a share in his divine priesthood. Right? It's the most intimate uh, bond and gift that he's given to them. And that very night, they betrayed him. Peter, right? His vicar says, I do not know the man. He swears three times. And so, now they're together again. And it says, the gospel, and the apostles were filled with fear. Right? Not just wonder, man, like, whoa, resurrected body. It's like, here we are together again. Think about it. What's he going to say to us, right? We know what we would probably say, right? <clears throat> yeah. Do you remember me? <laughs> Weren't we here? Weren't you protesting, Peter? I'll be faithful even unto death, throwing it in their face. 
you have something to say to me, right? We would probably take that approach. What does our Lord say to them? Peace be with you. Right? He breathes on them. He melts their hearts with his peace. Right? He converts them by that act of meekness. And he makes them then instruments of forgiveness. Whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven them. They can do that because they have first been forgiven. They're conscious of that now, right? As we need to be as well. Peace be with you, right? Overcoming evil with good, anger with meekness. So, uh, Fray Luis de Leon says it's really a sign of perfection. He says, Christ is meek because he is charitable. He is so loving because he is so meek. And because he is excessive in love, he is meekness in excess. Okay, so a sign of the perfection of charity is meekness. And that's, uh, uh, St. Thomas says, wherefore meekness above all makes a man self-possessed. In the book of wisdom, it says, my son, keep thy soul in meekness. Keep thy soul, right, in meekness. And that's why our Lord leaves it then as the one of the two lessons, right, of all that he signals out is, again, his sacred heart, which is the, the nexus, right, of all that he is and all that he wants to teach us, of his love for us. He asks us to imitate that heart. He gives us two lessons. He doesn't say go learn to work miracles, to multiply bread, uh, to preach. And of all the virtues he practices, he signals out two. The imitation of Christ says, as if they contained all the rest. For he says, come to me, all ye that labor, right, stressed out, and are heavy burdened, and I will refresh you. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me. Learn what? Learn of me, because I am meek and humble of heart. And you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is sweet and my burden light. Jesus, meek and humble of heart, make our hearts like unto thine. Amen.